thank you for uh, the invite to take part in this great and important event and I'd like to reiterate that the um, speech just before from the government of India was, was very compelling. Um, so hello and welcome to this panel discussion on climate crisis. What will it take to deal with a deadlier pandemic? I just quickly want to say before we start the panel, um, for me personally, there's been a visceral feeling, um, especially this year, that the climate crisis is here and it's not going to go away. Um, so there's been so many examples, which I'm sure you're, you're all aware of too. Um, there's been the wildfires in Australia um, and in the USA recently, um, with those scary pictures of red skies all over social media. Um, in the global south, in India, there have been droughts. In East Africa, unusually, unusually dry weather. And um, last week, nearly a million people in the Philippines were evacuated from their homes after strong, typhoon, strong typhoons linked to our changing climate. And that's just one example of, of many that have happened this year. Um, so we've only got 45 minutes, so I'm keen to get into the debate on how we can accelerate support for climate entrepreneurs who are key and vital to helping all of us tackle this urgent emergency. Um, we're going to have questions at the end, so there's a chat box on the right, so please um, put in your questions and we'll try and answer some of them after the panel debate. Um, I'll quickly introduce the panel. So we have Mr. John Room, Regional Director, South Asia Sustainable Development, World Bank Group. Mr. John Balbeck, Director, Impact Investments at the MacArthur Foundation. And Mr. Nithin Kamath, Founder and Chief Executive Officer at Zeroda and Rain Matter. Um, so I'd like to start with um, Mr. John Room. Um, thank you for joining the panel today. Um, my first question to you will be, how is the World Bank supporting governments, especially in the global south, in dealing with climate crises and transitioning towards a low carbon economy? Thank you very much uh, and good to see everybody virtually. Sorry, I can't be there. Before I answer your question directly, I just want to step back for a minute and recognize that we are in the middle of a huge economic and health crisis that is preoccupying a lot of people in terms of impact on livelihoods, people dying, entrepreneurs and businesses are getting hit on their balance sheets, and there's lots of income pressure uh, that companies are facing. But if we step back to the pre-COVID world, we know that we've made a lot of progress on poverty reduction, malnutrition, literacy, but there are significant problems with excluded people, environmental indicators are all going the wrong way, climate, as you said, is already having a bad impact and it will have a worse impact. And even when we have a vaccine and we've dealt with COVID, all of these issues are still going to be there. In fact, COVID has actually highlighted a number of the problems that we're facing and the challenges we'll have to have. But there's an opportunity to say, let's not leave this crisis uh, as a, an unused opportunity. Let's use this opportunity to build back better. Now, I have to be realistic to say when we talk to governments and we talk to a lot of companies, they are absolutely preoccupied with the short term, either budget hits or health or vaccines or just trying to keep their, their companies open. Having said that, we really believe that the time is now to start thinking about how to build back better. And so what does that mean? Okay, let's think about what we're calling the prize. What would the prize of uh, building back better look like? P, productivity. We've got to focus on increasing incomes and getting jobs. R, resilience to COVID, to climate shocks, other financial shocks that come in. I, inclusion. Focusing on the excluded, cast members, um, lower cast members, migrants, smallholder farmers, S for sustainability, how do we use the air and soil better? Efficiency, better use of our water, land, uh, how do we use the carbon budget that we have most efficiently? So within this dialogue, although your question was on low carbon, I would like to frame it a little broader in a number of ways. First of all, 
particularly for South Asia, it's as much about building resilience as it is about low carbon. They're related, but we've got to keep both of them focused. Secondly, this is not just like climate crisis is happening over here on the one side, and the rest of the development world and the business world carries on. It's not an add-on, it's fully integrated. Third point I would make is that yes, it's a climate crisis, but it's also a climate opportunity. If you think about dealing with air pollution, you get health benefits, climate smart agriculture, you can get productivity up, resilience up, and emissions down by doing smart things. You can build a resilient infrastructure that costs less. You can give people faster access to energy through renewables. You can do green buildings that will create jobs. I could go on and on and on. You can have more efficient businesses. What strikes me, if you talk to the likes of Mahindra, Dalmia Cement, uh, Unilever, all of them say that by focusing on being more efficient and resilient from a climate perspective, it helps their bottom line. So all of this adds up to the point of saying, it's not just seeing climate on the one side, but how it all comes together. When you step back and look at this, clearly there's a public sector role here, but public money is tight and it's going to be tight. So we're going to need to crowd in private finance. There is a lot of finance that is sitting underdeployed out in the financial markets at the moment. These markets are liquid looking for good opportunities. The question is, how do we make it greener and how do we help that money flow into particular greener deals? Next point I would make is that innovation and new markets are our friend. If we didn't have the issue of innovation, I would be very worried about the future. But just think this is technology and institution. Think where we've come on solar PVs, the opportunities on electric vehicles, batteries. We've created Tesla. We've created WebEx that we're dealing with here. Previous speaker talked about big data. That gives us huge opportunities, not only on the backbone, but the services that you can put on top of it. And for me, the big area where technology, both institutional and technological, can make a, a big difference is in cooling. We know that unless we can get a better approach to cooling, we're going to blow through any carbon budget. And unless we can get cooling into warm countries, we're going to uh, not get the kind of productivity and livelihood outcomes that we need. However, there are opportunities in terms of different financial models, institutions in order to build it. So when we take this together, the way we look at this from the World Bank, the key is to bring a multi-sector piece together and to get the pieces working at scale. So you need things at the deal or the country level, demonstrating new uh, solar, concentrated solar power. We need country level plans. We need to facilitate entrepreneurs that add value on top of that big data. However, you can't just operate deal by deal and support a transaction by transaction. We need interactions at the policy level. And for us, two of the biggest are around getting prices right, putting a price on carbon so that the signals are there that the, uh, the field is leveled and that subsidies are better allocated. Right now, subsidies for fossils, fuels, fertilizers, are sending exactly the wrong action. If we could get the progress on those policy issues, the signals and opportunities would be much greater. For governments, they could be screening uh, and allocating national budgets to these kinds of uh, priorities. But it's not just at the deal level and the policy level, as you have highlighted in some of the other speakers, we've got to get changes in the financial sector, okay, um, in order to try and get uh, not only specific structures to deal with risk, but also financial disclosure, uh, ways of getting policies in the financial sector right that will allow the finance to come together. And only when you get the company level, the policy level, and the finance level to come together would you get the kind of result that we're looking at. But looking at it in an integrated way, not climate here and business and development there, but integrated. From the World Bank Group's perspective, um, We've adopted this approach that makes this absolutely core and central to our business. We've mainstreamed climate into our strategy processes with countries. Um, in the last five years, we've doubled the investments that we make, and we will double them again. But we're focusing on transformation and policy across the World Bank Group. Um, we've done things like supporting um, individual deals like the Trishuli hydropower deal in Nepal. 
But more importantly than that, we're trying to think now about how we can have a more systemic impact in the kinds of things uh, that we're doing. So we're supporting the Super 6 wind projects in Pakistan that will provide enough power to 450,000 homes. Um, we've worked with 600 factories in Southeast Asia in order to try and make garment factories greener. And so there's lots of opportunities to try and bring the public sector and the private sector together in order to address these issues. And maybe I could come back later if there's time to elaborate a little bit more on what that means. Thank you. Over. Um, thank you. Um, so next we're going to move to uh, Mr. John Bellback from the MacArthur Foundation. Um, it'd be great if you could give us an idea of what you think the role foundations can play in dealing with the climate crisis. Thank you. Sure, thank you so much. And, and first of all, thank you to, uh, to the SunCop Forum for including MacArthur as, as part of this important discussion. We have just a tremendous amount of respect for this annual gathering, for its leadership. So it, it's a real privilege to be part of this, this panel today. Um, for those of you who don't know, MacArthur is a, a private, uh, a U.S. private foundation that's based in Chicago in the United States. We have a little under $7 billion in assets, and we have been actively engaged in pursuing efforts to support climate change mitigation since 2015. So to answer this, this broad question around how foundations can, can play a role in addressing the climate crisis, uh, what I'll, I'll try to do is touch on maybe three key levers where, where we at MacArthur have engaged, and that might be instructive in terms of ways that other philanthropic actors can, can play an important role as, as well. And so those, those three roles would include, one is, is traditional grant making that's built around a specific theory of change. And, and for that, we've, we've launched what we call a big bet initiative called Climate Solutions, which is a climate change mitigation strategy. Uh, a second would be grants that can stimulate and support private sector activities. Uh, and this gets to some of the things that John was talking about and the importance of, of unlocking the trillions that are needed from uh, private sector actors. So that's a, a second area. And then a third would be impact investments. So taking those one by one, uh, maybe I'll start with the traditional grant making. So at MacArthur, um, our Climate Solutions Big Bad Initiative, our theory of change for that effort is, is focused on supporting efforts that uh, can strengthen the leadership of three key countries. So the, the three countries that we believe represent the tipping point in terms of their leadership when it comes to climate change mitigation. Uh, and uh, we feel like, I think it's, it's clear that these three countries must significantly reduce greenhouse gas emissions if we are to prevent the worst effects of global warming. And those include uh, the United States, India, and, and China. And to this end, since, since 2015, uh, we have, MacArthur has made more than 300 million in grants to help uh, continue and accelerate U.S. greenhouse gas reductions, uh, increase and sustain U.S. political consensus for climate action, provide incentives for a low carbon economy, broaden the economic and health benefits of clean energy, and support India's growing national, regional, and global leadership on climate change, particularly on the adoption of renewable energy production. And in India in particular, in particular the, the foundation supports civil society organizations that are working with the government on climate policy, filling knowledge gaps to spur renewable energy production, and encouraging uh, adoption of clean uh, technology, uh, as well as exploring pollution pricing and emissions trading. So that's uh, the, the, the specific Big Bad Initiative and program that we've uh, launched and have been engaged in since 2015. Uh, in addition, uh, a second area where foundations can play an important role is in this sort of middle area where they can, they can help to stimulate and support private sector activity. And, and here, maybe I'll talk about a, a, a few ways that, that MacArthur has engaged in this work, and, and we've seen others engage in this work quite effectively. So one is uh, design funding. And, and what I mean by that is, is grant making that helps to uh, structure a financial vehicle, an investment vehicle. Uh, and an example of, of what this, this could look like is, 
is we, in, in partnership with Convergence, which is a, a really terrific global leader in the blended finance community, we, we together provided design funding to support the development of the Climate Finance Partnership, which is a $500 million BlackRock managed facility that's investing in sustainable infrastructure in Southeast Asia, Latin America, and Africa. And the governments of France and Germany, along with several philanthropic actors, have provided a catalytic capital tranche to that vehicle that, that makes the vehicle work. So they've heard that. So this is effectively a blended finance structure with a catalytic capital tranche. Uh, so that's one. The second would be tool development. Uh, and here, an example of this would be the Crane tool. And, and Crane is, uh, it stands for Carbon Reduction Assessment of New Enterprises. And this is an online open source software tool that MacArthur and some others supported to assess the emissions reduction potential and thus the climate impact of early stage technology ventures. Um, a third area is project preparation. And what I mean by this is, is grant funding that can help to prepare high quality investment grade projects that to, to basically bring them over the finish line and make them eligible for long-term debt financing. Uh, and an example of this is the US India Clean Energy Finance Facility. Uh, this is an up to $20 million partnership with the USDFC, the government of India, and a series of philanthropic actors, including MacArthur. Uh, and this effort has mobilized $200 million from 14 different international and domestic lenders today. Uh, and then lastly, an area that um, MacArthur is not engaged in, but I think is an important area of support for the foundation and philanthropic community is technical assistance. And this is providing capacity building and market development support uh, in areas like uh, renewable, distributed renewable energy production. Uh, so that's the this sort of middle ground. And then last, the last area that I'll, I'll touch on is impact investments. And uh, at MacArthur, we, uh, we have been pursuing impact investments for about 35 years now, and we take what we describe as a catalytic capital approach uh, to uh, an impact-led approach to our investing, where we, we seek to address capital gaps uh, and, and design and support vehicles that help to bridge those, those gaps. Uh, and two examples uh, that have climate relevance from our broader portfolio one includes the, the Prime Impact Fund, and this is a, uh, a purpose-built fund that is supporting early-stage technology ventures across what is known as the valley of death in technology commercialization. And what this means is uh, technology that is developed at a certain point through grant funding, that grant funding is exhausted, but there's still a wide gap between when the technology is a de-risk to the point that private sector capital, venture capital would be willing to invest in it. And this, this is a, quite a pernicious gap when it relates to a hard technology, capital intensive, climate relevant technologies. And this, this fund is purpose built to address that. Last, last example I'll, I'll, I'll note is uh, uh, an example in India, which is um, we made an anchor LP commitment, limited partner commitment into a fund encouraged solar finance that's investing in non-banking financial companies, NBFCs in India, that are interested in uh, adding solar finance to their to their repertoire. Uh, and uh, these uh, these NBFCs are taking on the, the 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 high perceived risks around the economics of MSME. Uh, solar finance, rooftop finance. And uh, our understanding, our view of this is that capital is flowing quite well at the utility scale and the large scale commercial uh, market in India. But as you move down market, capital is blocked for MSME rooftop solar. This fund is providing the necessary equity capital to NBFCs in India to take on and, and, and to provide, as, as John noted, a demonstration that the economics are viable. And, and our hope then is that helps stimulate the market and will drive in more capital into this important area. So I'll pause there um, and, and happy to take any, any questions on any of this later in the, in the discussion. Uh, thank you, John, um, especially for giving us lots of good, tangible um, examples. And again, um, 
we're going to take questions at the end, so um, please um, put any questions that you have into the, the chat box on the right hand side if, and we'll, we'll take them at the end. Um, so the next speaker we're going to have is uh, Mr. Nithin uh, Kamath. Um, Nithin, so you've, you've founded um, a climate fund. What inspired you to start this after working in the fintech space for many years? Thanks, uh, Rebecca. Uh, I mean, it's, a, it's an honor to be on this forum. We've just started, you know, getting started in this journey of giving back. And uh, it's a privilege to be around people who've been doing this for so long. Uh, so, yeah, so uh, we run a stockbroking business. So we are the largest uh, retail stock brokerage firm in India. We have over three and a half million customers. And these three and a half million are the privileged few in India, which is the top one, two percent of the country, because those are the people who invest in stock markets. Uh, so as we as we did well as a business, uh, we realized that uh, there are bigger problems than just helping people invest better in the markets. Uh, and uh, so so we realized that climate change and and I think uh, employment uh, they kind of go hand in hand because uh, we believe that one of the ways to be able to create employment in India is, is going back to agriculture, sustainable farms. Um, so, so yeah, so, so we said we should do something about it in uh, whatever capacity it's possible. So we have, we have, we're working on three different ideas. One is investing uh, into climate change startups. So uh, uh, because we realize that today in, in our, our technology has helped us become as big as we are in, in financial services. Uh, you know, techno technology is very important uh, you know, and even in climate change. So, you know, you need to kind of leverage uh, technology to solve for the problems we are facing. So we said, maybe we should identify and help startups for finding it tough to get seed capital, right? As in, so, uh, uh, so one, one, one thread is that. Uh, two is we realized, like I said earlier, we need to create employment and employment can't be, uh, what's happening in India is uh, with increased automation, you're kind of losing jobs in the lower skill area. So the, the real big problem for the country is how do you create jobs? And uh, so yeah, so, uh, so we think it's, you know, it's, it's reverse migration. You know, you need to get people back to villages and working on agriculture. So, so we're trying to uh, help grassroots organizations who are working on collective farming and you know, using sustainable forms of agriculture because uh, you know, during this COVID times, we realized that a lot of people went back to their villages. Uh, and and I think uh, the way to solve uh, a lot of Indian problems is to find ways to keep the villagers back there, right? And uh, because our cities are choking, and I don't think our cities can really handle too many people coming and staying there, right? And and the third thing, uh, which which you know, which is a longer term plan that we're working on, is uh, is to see if you know we can create some kind of a digital green asset. Uh, because on one side, we have access to all of these Indians who, uh, who are the privileged few. Uh, is, is there a way for us to go get approvals from the regulator to create a, a digital green asset and, and sell it? Uh, I mean, and, and sell it because even, I think more than, more than uh, the, 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 you know, the doing good part here is that, is there a way can we create consciousness uh, amongst uh, our customer base, you know, does owning a, 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 a digital green asset uh, create a, some kind of a consciousness amongst the customers saying, you know what, I need to cut down on my plastic consumption, you know, I need to maybe stop excessively buying stuff. I mean, can you create some kind of a awareness uh, amongst customers using this digital green asset? Uh, so we're still not sure what is a green asset. I mean, one of the things that we are piloting right now is, as an idea is, is to uh, take a piece of land, uh, grow a food forest and uh, and then uh, you know use the cash flows to create an asset of sort and and uh, and you know and get customers in into that asset and see if their behavior is you know, see if people are interested to firstly buy it and and then see if their behavior changes once uh, once they hold the asset right um, so yeah so those, those are those are some of the things that, that we're working on and we think we are positioned well uh, you know having their access to that rich Indian customers to be able to kind of make a difference in this space. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Nithin. I think, yeah, the idea of a, a digital green asset does sound very compelling. Um, that's very interesting. Um, so I think we've got about 10 minutes left. Um, I just 
quickly before we get to questions, want to ask each panellist to share concluding remarks on what they think are the most pressing actions that stakeholders must take collectively to address the climate crisis? I know it's a big question, um, but it's an important question. Um, could we start with uh, Mr John Room, please, to give his ideas on that? Yeah, thank you. So I would start first with government and policy makers. Number one, as pressing as the short term challenges are, the sooner we can get a focus on building back better and greener across the policy, the better off we're going to be. And I know it's difficult, but we've got to get that focus now. And in so doing, number one, systemically ensuring that government expenditures are green and leveraging and that we create the policy environment to free up finance and private sector innovation. Second block would be for private sector corporations. Here, I think mainstreaming climate resilience and low carbon is an opportunity. And these are the companies that are going to end up being the stronger companies in the future. It's in your interest to do it. Look at science-based targets. Look at what you can do and make this a core part of what you're doing. Not a sustainability office on the side. Bring it into the chief executive's office. And as private sector, make it very clear what you need from the financial sector and from the government in terms of policy. On the financial sector side, um, Number one, I think, would be to agree to and sign up to various risk disclosure fora. You can argue which one is which, but between the financial institutions and the, and the central banks, having a clear mandate and probably voluntarily initially, but then mandated to disclose your financial risk because of climate change would be something that would then generate an environment that will make it more easy to do things. And then for development institutions uh, like ourselves and the foundations, number one, see climate and health and development as fully integrated. They're not separate. It's not a side issue. And for the rich donor countries, yes, we have uh, private sector is going to be very important. Yes, innovation is going to be important. But that doesn't mean that a core tranche of grant money to do the important public and leveraging things isn't important. It's absolutely critical that the, that the donor community continues to provide that information and that, um, that, that source of financing available. And then finally, um, innovate, innovate, innovate. Okay, we're not going to get out of this problem by doing business as usual on the technology front and on the institutional front the way we did it before. We're going to reach farmers if we're going to do um, green buildings, if we're going to have energy efficiency. Yes, there's a technology piece, but the institutional innovations on how you actually implement these things is probably more important than the technological innovations. Because if we can innovate institutionally and incentive-wise, the technological innovation will follow later. So, thank you. Over. Thank you. Um, that's a great answer. And um, Mr. John Belbeck, um, what are your thoughts on you know the, the most pressing actions stakeholders can take? Yes, I guess one thing I'm, I'm struck by how how much I agree with with everything that John has said. So I would just start by by uh, just echoing and, and giving a strong plus one to to the comments that he made, and maybe to amplify some of those points a, a bit. Um, one would be uh, just really strong need for consensus and acknowledgement of climate risk in the investment sector. Efforts like the, the Task Force for Climate-Related Financial Disclosures or the TCFD are, are great steps forward in this regard, but, but more adoption and consensus is, is needed here. Um, and then in addition to the economic imperative of acknowledging climate risk, there there really needs to be a recognition that climate change is an issue of social justice with wide ranging implications if it's if it's not addressed. There's uh, a crying need for ambition and urgency. Uh, we need more action. We need the scale of that action to increase. 
and we need to understand that the the window in which we can act is is closing. Uh, and that idea of ambition and urgency uh, includes uh, things like embracing the full continuum of capital. And that includes catalytic capital. That's capital that's willing to take this proportionate risk. It's willing to accept a concession in the service of trying to achieve an impact, in the service of trying to unlock uh, the, the significant private sector capital, the trillions that John has noted that, that I've tried to note here as well that, that are needed to address this, this issue. Um, and, uh, and I think that's just essential uh, to, uh, to include. And then uh, also I would, I would say there needs to be a willingness to collaborate across sectors and, and regions uh, to do more than what could be, what could be done uh, on, on one's own. At the end of the day, when, when you adjust for time, the energy transition will occur. It's inevitable. The whole game is really about how do we compress that time period to avoid the worst effects of the, the climate crisis. And that requires urgency. It requires ambition. It means that we have to act now and we have to act immediately. Okay, thank you. Yeah, another great answer. And um, lastly, not, but not least, um, Nithin, what, what are your views on the most pressing actions that stakeholders need to take to help us tackle this climate emergency? Well, I'll, I'll do a plus one, plus one, <laughs> what, what John said. Uh, no, I mean, see, we're just getting started in this journey. Uh, I, I don't really have a world view on this, uh, but uh, but in the context of India and what we've seen, I think it's about enabling entrepreneurship in the villages. Because um, you know, I think I think you need to educate people, uh, and and education happens if people are earning money. Uh, and uh, so 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 it's it's about I think it's about creating employment in the right places, which is which is for me I think it's agriculture in India, which is uh, we need to find ways to promote the sustainable forms of agriculture and food follows and etc. Thank you. Um, so we've got about five or seven minutes left and I'm, I'm keen to get to, to audience questions because we've got some, some great comments um, that have come in. Um, the first question is, is for Mr. John Roo. Um, is the World Bank looking to transform the result-based financing with regenerative or climate smart agriculture? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the specifics of that question are aiming at, but let me um, try two, two, two pieces to that. I think the first piece is that in everything we're doing, climate smart agriculture is now the framework that we're using to think about the agricultural transformation that's going to take place, particularly in South Asia, there needs to be an agricultural transformation that will increase incomes at the farmer level, that will reduce vulnerability to climate change and will reduce emissions. And it is possible to do that through various institutional adjustments in terms of how markets work, how extension services work, and very importantly, in terms of how public expenditure and particular subsidies work. Right now in many countries, you get paid more money if you put more fertilizer into the ground. If you could repurpose those subsidies, I'm not even talking about reducing the subsidies, using exactly the same amount of subsidies and putting that number one in the hands of farmers to do the kinds of things that they need to do. And number two, incentivizing that so that that money goes to climate resilient, low carbon kinds of things, you could dramatically change the incentive structure and allow this to put us on a, slight, on a very different footing. The second thing that we're doing is in terms of our interventions, from the World Bank's perspective, we can finance in one of three ways. We can finance specific investments we can finance results, or we can finance against policy change. Traditionally, we've put a huge amount into financing just the investments, but I think what we're discovering 
is that if we move to what we call the program for results, which allows our financing to be Swiss against real outcomes um, or against policy changes, for example, reform of the fertilizer uh, sector or changes in marketing structures, we can get bigger leverage and transformational leverage. Because in the end, we can put $100 million or $200 million or $500 million into an investment operation. But if that doesn't leverage the overall transformation of the sector, we're not being as effective as we have to do. So the lens we're using, yes, number one is climate smart agriculture as the frame in which we think about it. And number two, we're very much thinking about how our investments and our analytic work and our convening power will transform fundamentally the agricultural sectors in the countries we're dealing with and not just looking whether $100 million in seed development or $100 million in uh, extension services are uh, satisfactory in their own right. Over. Okay, thanks. So, so, so you're looking, uh, John, at systemic change with, the, with your capital. Essentially, that's what I got from that. Exactly. Okay. Thanks. Okay, so just quickly moving on to the next question because I want to try and get to them all. I think this is um, a good question um, for, for Nithin and um, it relates to his idea, I think, of a, a digital green asset. Um, the question is, how can climate consciousness be inculcated into the lives of the masses to the point where action becomes a part of their natural behaviour? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a really tough problem to solve. Uh, but, but the way we are thinking is, uh, uh, you know, if someone is, you know, if we can sell the idea of owning a digital green asset, right, uh, we, we, the, the assumption here is maybe you're kind of enabling the whole consciousness to, you know, in some form. Uh, we've, we, I've, I've tried to experiment this with a, with a bunch of you know, people that I know, uh, which is uh, getting them to buy small pieces of land and, and growing trees. Uh, we've done it in a very, you know, kind of, uh, you know, in a small scale, just just to, just as an experiment, and and then you know, small little changes in the behavior, right? As in, as in people, you know, people thinking about, um, you know, you know, this whole excessive consumerism, which is I think which is which is a big problem in today's world, right? And uh, just you know, just holding, you know, when 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 people were buying into this asset, we kind of explained the problems of excessive consumerism. We also uh, we also were trying to explain this this whole problem with monoculture, right? Uh, saying how it's important to create biodiversity and not just 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 plant for the heck of planting something, right? Uh, so yeah, so I mean uh, the way we are thinking of right now is that we're speaking to the local governments and trying to buy large pieces of land and and turn them into like a biodiverse forest and see if we can kind of. Uh, get the cash flows from this into a securitized kind of instrument and then go to uh, the regulators, get an approval for it and then see if we can actually uh, then market it to our customers. Not, not to make a buck here, it's just to, just to uh, you know, like I said, just to see if uh, owning that asset will create some kind of consciousness. It's a bet. I don't know if it will work or not. Uh, I, I, think it, I think of it almost like, you know, like with how, you, how, you, how people are buying Bitcoin where the underlying uh, you know, underlying uh, thing to Bitcoin is a, is a mathematical formula which is actually creating a lot of carbon footprint. And is there a way you can replace that with uh, with a tree or you know with a, with a green asset where you know it's it's actually a carbon offset versus a carbon footprint being created, right? Um, so yeah, so so that's that's how we're thinking about this. Okay, thank you. Um, so the next question is for Mr. Uh, John Balbach. Um, there are many entrepreneurs who are working on climate solutions, but they are not tapping the climate assets such as carbon credits as the costs and the market is not attractive. Is there anything that the MacArthur Foundation is supporting in this space? Yeah, so um, I would say there, so it's an incredibly important issue. Uh, and um, I, I would say there's, there's Two uh, efforts more broadly uh, that uh, what well, and say this is an important issue for us more broadly. Um, we've supported efforts like CDP, uh, which is um, the Climate Disclosure Project, uh, to to look at uh, helping to sort of elevate 
what is a, the the uh, shadow price for uh, for carbon. Um, we've also pursued various efforts uh, in the different regions uh, that we're engaging, and, and one in in particular is uh, an effort in India, uh, where in April April of 2019, the government of India issued a regulatory notification to allow emissions trading as a means of meeting environmental objectives. This really was a paradigm shift in India's environmental regulation and overcomes uh, a, a critical barrier, barrier for allowing market-based mechanisms to regulate po pollution. Uh, and this opened the door effectively for India's first cap and trade market where the traded commodity is particulate matter emissions that arise from coal that's being burned to fuel boilers and other equipment in use by companies located in the industrial cluster uh, of, of Surat. Uh, and the trading scheme, under the trading scheme, the local regulator, the Gujarat Pollution Control Board, sets a cap, issues permits, and ensures compliance with environmental regulations and laws. Uh, and uh, this, this effort, um, there's significant interest to replicate this effort uh, as, as market designs across several states. Uh, and, uh, and that's an effort that we, that's a, an example of a, a, a specific effort that we've supported and uh, that, that rolls up to a larger interest in this really important uh, idea more broadly. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so we've got about, I think, five or four or five minutes left. Um, so our next question, I think, which is, which is interesting is, out of all the capital in the world that is invested, is there an estimate of what percentage is actually triple water line focused, people, planet, profit? I do see, do see some great investments in the angel, venture and impact sectors that do meet triple water line, but in public equities, bond stocks, ETFs, almost everything I see that claims to be green or ESG upon close inspection fails the test and is maybe only strong on one of the P's. What percent of the world's capital do you think needs to be triple water line before we reach a tipping point needed to ensure capital goes to positive impact? Uh, that's quite a big question. Does anybody feel like they want to take that or I'll choose someone? I can give a comment or a take. I'm not Thank sure you. I can... I can actually answer it. Um, if one looks at the entire financial sector, the amount that is actually certified as green and climate responsive is incredibly small. It's in the single percentage. I don't know what the latest is, but it's something of the order of maybe 2% or something. I don't know, maybe John's got a better sense, but I know it's, it's very small. In particular, when you talk about uh, the bond financing and, where, and the size of those markets. Um, one question is uh, where the tipping point is, but right now I'm less focused on that. Given that the level is so low at the moment, if we simply, if it's 2% now, we can get that to 4%, okay, or we can get that to 5% in the next five years, Okay, that is a significant amount of money, and it starts to create a demonstration effect that will um, roll sort of like a tumbleweed beyond that, and will create a momentum that will move us in the right direction. It's a little bit like the question of the urgency we need. We know that we have to be carbon, uh, net carbon neutral by 2050, middle of the century, but we don't have to plot out all of the exact steps in order to get there. To me, what's important is over the next five to 10 years to get an ambitious movement in the right direction, show that it works, support it as well as we can. And I think success will take uh, its, its run from there on. Um, I know it's not a, a perfect answer and I don't have the, the, the data at the top of my head, but that's my take. Thank you. And, um, could, could I maybe jump in on that really quick as well? We've nearly run out of time, so if it's like literally 50 seconds, yes. I, I promise it'll be super quick. So I just wanted to refer the, the question, the person who asked the question to the Global Impact Investing Network. They do an annual survey 
on the assets uh, that are the impact assets in the market. And I believe their 2020 survey showed uh, a little over 700 billion in impact assets. I don't know what that equates to in terms of what's needed, the delta between what's available and what's needed. The other thing I would say is just, again, make a note of the importance of investors investing across the continuum of capital and not taking a binary, only a profit maximizing investment or only a grant approach. And that has an unlocking effect that can be quite significant. So those are the two points I wanted to add. Okay, thank you. And unfortunately, it's been a great debate, but we have run out of time. Um, sorry to all the questions that we didn't get didn't get to. Sorry, um, I'm going to hand back now to Avashi. Thank you.